Good morning, everyone. My name is Mithun. I will be doing the introductions for today. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Mr. Monish Pabrai. He's the owner and managing partner of the Pabrai Investment Funds. The funds manages more than $400 million in assets and uses a value-focused approach to their investments. The fund is globally renowned, not just for their performance track record, but also for their fee structure, because it's one of the few funds globally which does not charge a management fee and only charges a performance fee, an approach that has been inspired by the Warren Buffett partnerships, which ran in the 1950s and 60s. Mr. Pabra is also an author, and his book, The Dando Investor, is a fantastic read for aspiring entrepreneurs amongst us. He has more recently been featured in the book, Richer, Wiser, Happier, by celebrated and renowned financial journalist, William Green. We are very happy to have Mr. Pabrai with us. The floor is all yours, Mr. Pabrai. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mithun. You know, I'm a huge fan of Singapore. And of course, you know, I've uh, been a student of Lee Kuan Yew for a long time. And the amazing miracle that he created in Singapore. So it's, uh, it's and you know, I, I know that NUS is up there. So very few times do I get to speak to such an august audience. So it's a pleasure and an honor to be with all of you. It's an interesting format that I was given to follow. So I'll, uh, I'll try to follow the prescribed format where we'll go through about 40 minutes of a monologue where I go through maybe one or more investments and kind of what, what was the journey and trajectories and all that like. So what I thought might be useful for all of you is to, it will kind of go into, you know, how do you expand or think about your circle of competence and how that can affect and over time improve you as an investor. So I've got four different investments that I want to talk about. I am not very optimistic that in 40 minutes we'll get through all four. So we'll see how far we can get down the list. But I know that we will hit 40 minutes before we hit the four. So I won't be having, you know, empty time. So I kind of plan for a little bit more than I needed. So going back, going back all the way to maybe around 34 years ago, 33, 34 years ago, I had just started my first business IT services company. I had just gotten one of my first clients. I used to live in Chicago. The client was in Wisconsin. It was called JI Case, which is a manufacturer of farm and construction equipment. They are now part of CNH, which is based in Europe. But the JI Case was a company based in Racine, Wisconsin. You know, I had uh, I had gotten a fairly large contract for them for uh, a variety of IT services. The company had had been doing very poorly for a while. They'd been losing money for a while. So they were very tight-fisted in all the, you know, the amounts they were willing to pay and the negotiations and all, because they were just kind of scrambling on their end. But there was one part of the company, which was their finance arm, where whenever I did work with that group, they never tried to negotiate with me. And they always seemed to have a lot of cash. And it was like almost like I was dealing with a, different company, even though it was a subsidiary. So I, I asked the CIO, I said, well, you know, James, why, why are these, uh, this, all the rest of your guys beat me up on price and everything else, but these guys, they don't. He says, oh, they have a lot of money and the rest of us don't, but they have a lot of money. So it prompted me to look into why is it that the finance arm of Case was doing so well when the equipment arm was doing so poorly. And what I discovered is that captive finance companies, like if you have Ford Motor Company and there's Ford Credit or Toyota and Toyota Credit and that sort of thing, where they are, you know, kind of financing their own vehicles, et cetera, those businesses are extremely good businesses. And normally lending is not such a good business. In fact, I've had a lot of permanent wipeouts and losses in the investing in levered financial institutions. And actually, I don't invest in them anymore because I think I'm very bad at them. But captive finance arms are very different. And the reason they're different is, so if you think about, you know, like the certified pre-owned Lexus, for example, right? You know, you go to a Lexus dealer and, you know, they've got the Lexus cars, but they also have the certified pre-owned. So certified pre-owned is only possible with Lexus. You can't have it with anyone else because they can give you a Lexus warranty. They can tell you we've done all the checks and inspections and and it gives a halo, the brand halo. So it, 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 it has similar halo to buying a new car, right? In the sense that they're giving you 
a lot of assurance that you're getting a great car. So when Lexus finances one of their cars, and let's say it's a three-year or five-year or seven-year finance deal, and let's say the borrower defaults, you know, doesn't make his payments, et cetera, they can repossess the car. And when the car comes back to them, they are in a very privileged position versus a typical lender. So if I'm just like, you know, Citibank or Chase or someone who made a loan and the borrower defaults and the asset comes back to me, I have so many different assets I am dealing with that I don't have a particular expertise or competence in a Lexus. You know, Lexus, BMW, Mercedes, they all look the same to Citibank. There's no difference for them, right? So when, when these cars come back to Citibank, for example, and there's been a default, et cetera, Citibank will just, you know, send it to auction or whatever and try to get rid of it quickly and try to salvage and get as much money out of it so that they minimize their losses or come out ahead or whatever. But in the case of Lexus, it's a little bit different. So when they repossess the car, they have the option of refurbishing it, making it part of Lexus pre-owned, bringing it back into their dealer channels for sale and getting a good price for it. So their ability to work with that asset is very different than the ability of a city or someone. And when you go to like equipment finance, like, you know, the, the tractors and all of that, now those are business tools, right? They're the critical business equipment you need for your business. So first of all, default rate should be lower because you're, you know, you will let the house go. You're going to let many things go before you're going to let the tractor go. Because that's, you know, you know if they repossess the tra- tractor, you're in trouble. So first of all, default rates are low. But secondly, if, they, if there is a default and it comes back to them, they again have the same abilities like Lexus. They can refurbish and they can sell it through the dealer network, et cetera. And so I found that what I learned from that experience when I was running my IT company is, uh, wow, these captive finance companies are really interesting. You know, it's just something I kept in my head. And, you know, in the financial crisis, when all the auto companies were facing severe issues and they went bankrupt, GM and Chrysler went bankrupt, but Ford did not go bankrupt. And the reason Ford did not go bankrupt is because of Ford credit. So Ford credit was so strong that it carried the company even when the rest of it was just as bad as GM. And and GM had taken their GMAC and they had gone into mortgage lending and a number of other things, which hit them really hard. So they actually, you know, kind of left the reservation and went off the reservation basically, and they paid the price. So the captive finance arm of Lexus should not be financing BMWs. You know, you want to keep it to Lexus because that's where it has real power and competitive advantage. So this, this experience I had was in the early 90s, just observing this, right? In 2012, which is, you know, maybe something like, 30 years, uh, uh, yeah, almost 30 years after I uh, made that made that investment, I made an investment in Fiat Chrysler in the fund. So in when I when I learned about all about this captive finance, I was a you know running an IT company, wasn't running a fund or anything. But when I made the investment in Fiat Chrysler, one of the things I looked for was their captive finance arm because I knew that that piece is really good, and it did not exist. So they had been so decimated, the capital had been so decimated, they had sold everything off, including the captive, captive finance. Of course, a number of things had changed in that business where it became a lot better business after the financial crisis because they redid their union contracts, their cost structures went down. So Detroit actually went from being one of the worst places on the planet to build a car in up to 2007 to one of the best places on the planet to build a car in 2009 and beyond. It actually became very competitive. My interest in investing in Fiat Chrysler was because I think the world still thought of auto companies as terrible, you know, high CapEx, unionized, subject to consumer taste, just everything you can think of that's terrible in, in making an investment. And what they didn't realize is that when these companies went through bankruptcy, they got cleansed. So a lot of their retirement liabilities went away, the pension liabilities went away. They went and redid their union contracts and a number of other things came in their way. And the valuation was really off. Like the market cap of Fiat Chrysler was $5 billion and their annual revenues were $130 billion. So it was trading at about 4% of revenues. 
And so if, if they could write the ship and make even modest profits, I felt that they could make five, six, seven billion in a single year. So basically it'd be less than a PE of one against future earnings. And the other thing that was interesting to me was that, which is the main reason I made the investment was that Sergio Marchioni was the chairman of Fiat, uh, was the CEO of Fiat Chrysler. And I'd done a lot of work uh, looking into Sergio and he was just a off the charts exceptional leader. So anyway, we made the investment and from 2012 to 2022, it's a 10X. And unfortunately, I didn't capture the whole 10X because in the middle, Sergio died, which was a big shocker. But we made, we made several times the money. We've made like four or five times our money and such. But the thing is that in the process of owning Fiat Chrysler, I got to know John Elkan, who was the chairman, and he's part of the Agnelli family in Italy, which controls Fiat Chrysler. And I had many conversations with, uh, with John and I said that, you know, the finance arm, which doesn't exist because they had a dealer, Santander Bank, who was doing all the financing for them. I said, I said the finance arm is the one of the most important things to put in place. So I said, why aren't you guys putting resources behind it? Why aren't you guys, you know, I think the answer he gave was that we, we just don't have the financial strength. And what I also observed is while he was saying we didn't have the financial strength, they were pushing out very large dividends. And that made no sense to me. So I felt like almost like the Fiat Chrysler owners, they had been through so much trauma before that they wanted to like, you know, pull chips off the table. Whereas I felt that if that if that cash had gone into the finance arm, and I tried to ex- explain to John that, look, these captive finance arms are really, really exceptional businesses. And, you know, Santander Bank, you know, they, they finance everything. They, they don't have the same wherewithal as you guys would have. They never went down that path. So I wonder whether either they didn't understand it or there was something else that I didn't understand. But our investment still worked. But I think it would have been worked even better. So this is an example of how something happens in life. You know, uh, you cannot connect, connect the dots you know, looking forward, but you can connect them looking back. And then later something comes up, which is, you know, way in the future, 30 years in the future. And the dots connect and you can you can do something about it. So that's uh, that's something I just wanted to share that I, I learned about captive finance arms. And that's a data point I always have. So like recently I was looking at John Deere and I went straight to looking at their captive finance. Arms. And of course you see in John Deere equipment, you see a lot of cyclicality. You see ups and downs and all that. But when you look at John Deere finance, it's just a straight line up. There is no noise. There is no hiccups because, you know, you're financing for five or seven years. You really don't have high defaults. It's just a very smooth, beautiful line. And it's a great business. And I think they understand how, how good that business is. So, you know, I think that's an example. But another time, you know, I, I think this was in 2002, or 2003, I had read somewhere a long time ago, probably in the 90s, that the failure rate, there was an article about the failure rate of different businesses in different SIC codes, you know, SIC code what we use in the US for different industry classifications. So there was this article about failure rate of businesses by SIC code. And I noticed in that article that the lowest rate of failure of any type of business was funeral homes. So funeral homes basically pretty much never went out of business. And I found it really interesting. And I thought about it for a while. I think the reason funeral homes don't go out of business is multiple reasons. Number one, when all of you graduate, not one of you is going to say, I want to be the king of funeral services, or I want to join a funeral services operation. It's a morbid industry. Young people aren't looking to go down that path. So first of all, they're not a lot of entrants looking. Whereas, you know, if, if you look at something like Bitcoin, everyone and their brother wants to create something, a clone of Bitcoin, right? And be the first guy and have a bunch of them at one cent or whatever. But no one does that in funeral services. So, so you don't have a lot of intense pressure for people wanting to go into that business, which is not the same with airlines, right? Everyone wants to start airlines because they think it's it's fun and flashy. The second is that when we're looking for a place to do the last rites of our beloved uncle or, or aunt or father or mother or whatever, we're not going to take the low bid. 
So we're not going to call six places and compare prices. Okay, uh, we're going to uh, probably look at a place that has the family has worked with in the past, where there may be some history, and then go down that path. And we're not really going to be focused on price and such because so it's a morbid time, etc. And so it's not a business that faces intense pricing pressure. You know, they they can price how they want. They can even, you know, overprice it, if you will. And you may not even understand whether you were you were ripped off or not because you don't have a benchmark. You know, what should a funeral cost? How do I know? You know, I deal with one every you know, 40 years or something. So basically, it doesn't face those type of pressures. And the other is that the brand and the traditions of places that have been there for a while, they tend to have a following and such. So they were, I just noted that, it's interesting that you know funeral homes have a very low failure rate. Then I think in 2002, when I was running my fund, one of the things I do is I, I have a subscription to Value Line. I look at Value Line every week, and one of the things, you know, in their summary document, they have one of their lists is out of the 1,700 companies that they follow, the maybe the 50 companies with the lowest PEs. Then they have another 50 companies with the highest PEs. So they just uh, give you a list. And, and I always look at the low PE list, and usually you'll find some companies, P of two, P of three, and those are like real dogs. You know, like you should just avoid them like the plague. Usually what that means is if something's trading for two times earnings is basically that's in the past, there's no more earnings left. That engine has run out of juice, okay? But I noticed in 2002 that there were two funeral services companies sitting amongst the lowest PEs, they were sitting at a, both of them, one was sitting at a P of two and the other was sitting at a P of 2.3. So I said, it cannot be that these companies can't make money. If anyone can make money, they can make money. I mean, I don't know who all are going to die in Singapore in 2022, but I can tell you how many are going to die. Okay. So that's, you can come, come up with that number with a lot of precision. And so there is a recurrence in the sense that humans are going to die and certain percentage of the population is going to die and the revenue is going to show up and all of that. So I said, this is really strange. Why would a funeral services company treat at two times earnings, right? I mean, they should be at 20, 30 times earnings because they're just so stable. Even if they have no growth, they're so stable. In a low interest rate environment, it should be at least 10 times earnings, right? At that time, interest rates weren't so low. So I decided to dig in. Right. So one of the things I just want to tell you is that the reason I'm giving you this data is to just say, what is the trigger? There needs to be a trigger to dive in, right? So there's 50,000 stocks. The data set is too large. We can't look at all 50,000 stocks. So we have to have a way of shortlisting, right? So one of the things I'm looking for shortlisting is I'm looking for anomalies, something weird that makes no sense. This was something weird that made no sense. Right, So I said, let's dig in and find out what's going on. And when I dug in, what I found with these two companies, Stuart Enterprises and Service Corp, is they were very large publicly traded funeral services operators. And they had been doing a roll up for more than 10 or 15 years where they had been buying mom and pop funeral services, paying you know, 10, 8, 10, 12 times earnings. And then their own stocks were you know, worth a lot more. And they just kept doing that. And they had bought like thousands of funeral homes. And then what happened is they got too levered. Like in the case of Stuart Enterprises, they had bought a large number of funeral homes in Europe, but they were having trouble managing them. And so none of those funeral homes were producing any cash flow. So they had paid all this money out, but they were not making any money. And so they were kind of upside down where the debt service was difficult. And I said, you know, this sounds like a great business with a bad balance sheet, right? I mean, basically the the business is fine. It's the balance sheet that's stupid. And so I said, can can they get out of it? What, 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 What would happen here? I looked at the situation and they were, they were trading at two times earnings. Okay. So I said, look, all these people, they bought these funeral homes from. Okay. And and what student enterprises have done is, let's say they bought John Hardy Funeral Services, for example, in Kansas City, for example. They made no changes to the business. 
it was still called John Hardy because it had brand recognition. And the people who were their clients never realized the business had been sold. They still had the John Hardy family running it. And they tried to keep everything the same, right? Because the, the value was in the long longevity of that brand and that. So this was not one business like McDonald's with 1,000 locations. It was each individual place running with its own brand. Because if you kill that brand, you would really uh, take away value uh, and such. So I said, look, they bought John Hardy for maybe 10 or 15 times earnings, okay? If they go back to John Hardy and say, listen, would you like the business back for five times earnings? And John Hardy would say, yes, because they know how good a business it is. So they would say, these dumb asses paid me 3 million and I can buy it back for a million. Here's your million, goodbye, right? So I felt like if they had to, you know, kind of raise cash to take care of their bank debt, et cetera, because there were so many of these funeral homes, they could easily sell a few hundred mm -hmm. relatively quickly. And they would raise more enough cash to get their situation. So I said, I don't think, I don't think this can go bankrupt. I think they've got many different levers and they had some cash and they had about 18 months of breathing room and the markets don't like uncertainty. So they had punished the stock because of this. And then what happened in a few months is they actually did something better than I thought. They made a deal to sell all the European funeral homes. So the total cash flow those European funeral homes were generating was a big fat zero, actually it was negative. They were losing money. And they made about four or 500 million when they made that deal. So when they, when they sold it off, an asset which was stranded suddenly gave them a bunch of cash and the stock started moving, it doubled. Then it doubled again. Eventually, we moved on, but it was a very nice home run for us. And again, there it was just you know something I had read a long time ago, which I understood about funeral homes. And then you have this other understanding, which is good business, bad balance sheet. Can you can you work with that? And then you know kind of confluence of factors coming in, and and that works out. Another example it was a Canadian tubular steel producer. So they made these, you know, pipes and such that go into pipelines and waterways and that sort of thing. So Ipsco, Ipsco made these steel pipes. Like, you know, if you were laying pipeline from Canada to the Gulf Coast, you would contract with someone like Ipsco to create all the, all the piping and you'd give them like a two or three year contract to do that and so on. The nature of their business was that they had a lot of visibility into future earnings and cash flow because these, these were contracts you know the people building the pipelines wanted surety of delivery surety of price and so they signed these guaranteed contracts with companies like ipsco so ipsco was a company that was trading at about i think 40 odd dollars a share maybe 42 43 dollars a share they had no debt they had about 14 dollars in cash per share on their balance sheet and they had publicly stated that the next two years of earnings were $14 each in each of the next two years. And the stock was at like 42 or 43. So I said, okay, they are saying the future earnings because they have those contracts locked in. And so if you just take the current cash plus the next two years cash coming in, it's equal to the stock price. And they've got all these plants and equipment and inventory and everything else, brand and everything else, all that is available for zero. So I said, now markets don't like uncertainty, right? So after two years, there was absolutely no visibility of what earnings would be. It could go to $1, it might even go negative. We have no idea, right? And so because of that uncertainty, the markets were not willing to give this a 10 multiple or something, because they felt this was like peak earnings, for example, right? My take was that, hey, why don't I just, you know, buy the stock and watch this movie for two years, you know, get some popcorn, you know, turn on a big screen TV and just watch the movie for two years, see how it unfolds. And so I did that. I put about 10% of the fund assets, I think this was in 2004 or something into Ipsco. About like six, seven months later, they announced that we have one more year of visibility of earnings and we are again going to make another $14. I said, hallelujah. 
God loves me. So the stock is now at 60 and change because, you know, markets can now see that, okay, 42 is too low because they're going to make so it was 60 or 65 by then. Okay. And then markets got a little bit more bullish about them and the stock was trading at about 85 or 90 a share. And they had not made any more announcement. We just had the $60 guaranteed. And I was thinking, you know, should I take my chips off the table? I don't know what happens after three years, just like anyone else. And who knows what the situation looks like. And while I'm running through all these kind of mind games in my head, the stock suddenly goes to 148. Like I wake up one morning and I see if score that 148 and just a straight vertical line up. So I said, whoa, what's going on? And it turned out that some uh, Swedish company offered to buy them for like 155. So I said, God truly loves me because I was, I was happy to you know, take my chips off the table at 90 and move on. I did not wait for that deal to close. I didn't even wait for Ipsco to respond to that offer or any of those things. I just immediately placed buy or sell orders and we were done with Ipsco. And I think eventually that deal closed for 160 or 165 or something. And it became a private company under that Swedish company. So there again, I think the, the thing is that sometimes Wall Street gets confused between risk and uncertainty. This is an example of getting confused between risk and uncertainty. If, if school was a business with very high uncertainty, but the risk was very low. So when you generally run into a combination of very high uncertainty, very low risk, the end result is usually going to be very high returns. So that's a, that's a good formula to keep in mind. Amazingly, we have gotten through three examples and I haven't run out of time yet, which is great. We might even make it through most of the fourth example, fingers crossed. So the fourth example is uh, actually the very first investment I made on July 1st, 99, when my fund started. And it was a company called Silicon Valley Bank. And Silicon Valley Bank at this point might have a branch in Singapore. I'm not sure they've, they've expanded a lot. So at that time in July 99, one of my concerns was that valuations were getting pretty crazy. I mean, we were about, I didn't know it at the time, but we were about eight or nine months away from a massive implosion in the NASDAQ, the collapse of that dot-com bubble. But I knew that we were in a bubble. I had myself had a private dot-com and so I was... I was able to see things uh, which had already blown up. And so I could see things about maybe four or five months ahead of other what others could see. So I, I knew that, I mean, I recognized because I was a tech guy that the internet was transformation. But I also recognized that the valuations that we had in a bunch of these pets.com and whatever else was ridiculous. But I was, I was trying to find a way to play that arena where I have upside without downside. And I found that I found a way to play that with Silicon Valley Bank. So Silicon Valley Bank is a actually what, what I would have done really well on is if I, if I just held it from then till now. I actually held it for just about a year. I more than doubled or tripled my money and I moved on. But it's compounded at like 20% a year for like 20 years so far. It's done really well. It's a very unusual bank. It's headquartered in Silicon Valley. And their clients are mainly venture-backed tech companies. Their main clients actually are the top flight venture capitalists. So if you're Sequoia, or Anderson Horowitz, or Greylock, whoever, when you fund a, a, a company and you're the first venture capital going in, you're probably going to tell the company to open an account at Silicon Valley Bank. The reason you're going to tell them to open at Silicon Valley Bank because Silicon Valley Bank is very, has got a lot of expertise in dealing with tech companies. So the VCs know that they can get reporting from them, which is better than they can get from other places because they understand what the venture capitalists are looking for. The VCs in their term sheets would say, you need to send us these reports, show us the balances, whatever else. And they'll, they've got great reporting for them. The other thing they've got is that because it's almost like the captive lenders. So when a company gets venture capital, they don't want to spend that money buying servers and furniture and so on. Those things they would rather finance. 
right? So they're, they're, the money they raise goes further. And Silicon Valley Bank is really good at financing those things. So if, if a company is looking to buy a quarter million worth of servers, for example, computer equipment, they'll make that loan. And again, for them, it looks like a captive because if the company goes under and they get, you know, they get titled to those servers, they are, they are financing those every three days with some other, so they could go to some new startup and say, listen, I can give you all the servers at half off, you know, 70% off. And they're brand new, come and take a look at them. You know, a lot of people will take them up on that. So, so they have a way to recycle that asset in a way that most other lenders would not have because they are so homogeneous in or some company that goes under just bought a software license and that license is valuable and they can, again, recycle that license and so on. So their business is really good. But the other thing that what they were doing is in Silicon Valley, you know, when you go to a restaurant, you know, like Il Forneo or whatever, and the waiter serves you, even the waiter gets stock options. You know, the masseuses at Google got stock options. Everyone gets stock options. And so what Silicon Valley Bank did is whenever they made loans to these companies, they collected warrants from them on the side. So they made the loan and said, you also have to give us warrants. And so they would, they would collect these warrants. And they had hundreds and hundreds of these companies, which were their clients, and they had a huge amount of warrants, but there was no disclosure on how many warrants, which companies, whatever. But I knew that they were sitting on this huge stockpile of warrants, and these companies were going public. You know, at that time, the bubble, bubble hadn't burst. So I was only paying 10 times earnings for the business because no one was interested in these regular companies. Everyone wanted like, you know, sexy businesses and all that. In a few months after I invested, they started announcing that we monetized eight of these and we made so much money and they were dwarfing their earnings. So the amount they were making on those, when they, so they started gradually as these companies started going public, they started going into their, looking through their treasury and saying, okay, what do we have? And they started unloading those. And then the stock started reacting to that, you know, because, because they had this huge thing. And eventually we, we tripled our money and it was like the bubble burst. And, but I think by June or July of July, August of 20, 2000, which is just what a little over a year or 14 months after I made the investment, we were out and we, I think we've made a three X on it. So that, that worked out pretty good. And so that was a case where, you know, you had this unknown basket, but I'm not paying anything for it, right? I didn't know what was in the basket, but I was, again, it was low risk, high uncertainty, right? We weren't paying for it. And so the basket was utterly useless. I still have a well-run bank. And now they've expanded all over the place, and but they've kept to their, their knitting. They only deal with venture back companies and I think they have a very great niche in banking, and that's why they've done so well over all these years. So that gives you some sense of kind of four different investments, which is somewhat different from each other in different times. And what, what I'm looking for is I have no interest in some business that's trading at $10 and it's worth 13 or 15 or 17. That's not of interest. What I'm looking for is a wide mispricing. We don't necessarily need an information edge. We usually don't have an information edge, but we can have easily have an analytics edge. So in these situations, I had no information edge on Silicon Valley Bank. I don't know what's in that basket, but I can analyze it from a high level and say, I can't lose. I, I know that it's uncertain, but I can't lose. So it's okay. I can go in there, take it from there. So with that, I think we'll... Uh, Turn it back to Mithun and take it from there. And let me turn the volume up here. We'll try to go back and forth with the volume. Thank you, Mithun. Thank, Thank you so much, Thank Monish. You. We enjoyed the session. Over to Hashim for the Q&A moderation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mithun, for the insightful session. One of the interesting questions that I saw in the registration form was that if somebody who has just entered the fund management industry and wants to open their own fund at a young age without any track record on big institutional firms, how can they do it? If you, if you don't have a track record, I, I think that that's almost somewhat dishonest, if you will. So I would really encourage you to have something before you take other people's money. But if you're hell-bent on doing it, then uh, 
focus on friends, family, and fools. Hopefully the fools don't lose money, but go to your, go to your mom, go to your brother, go to your sister and take it from there. But I also feel that if you have got the chops to invest well, and you are young, even with a very modest amount of money, it, it is going to grow. I mean, that's just the, the power of compounding. You know, if you're, you're doing mid twenties a year, you're going to double every three years and 30 years, you're going to have a thousand times what you started with. So you don't need large sums. And in uh, 10 or 15 years, you can have a decent amount of money and a track record, and then actually have a legitimate reason to get others to give you money. Absolutely agree with you. The people tend to underestimate the power of compounding nowadays. The next question is, what do you think about people who think that value investing is dead in the modern era? All intelligent investing is value investing. So people have this misnomer that there's growth investing and value investing, and they're two separate things. It's two sides of the same coin. So what we're trying to do with investing is we, we're trying to put out a dollar today with the hope that we get more than a dollar in the future back. And the how long it takes to get $2 back or $3 back and, and, and such will determine our rate of return. And Definitely, you're going to do, in general, better if you invest in businesses which have strong growth prospects, as long as you're not paying too much for that growth. So it took me a long time to, to get there. But you know, if you buy a dollar bill for 25 cents, and it's not going to change much in value, and you're correct about that it's worth a dollar, you'll make four times your money. And depending on how long it takes to make four times your money, is whatever your analyzed rate of return is. But if you are able to invest in a Starbucks relatively early, they could have an infinite, almost an infinite number of stores globally. And the unit economics are so good. In the, in the US, when they open a Starbucks, in 18 to 24 months, they get all their money back that they put into a store. And internationally, they get it in 12 to 15 months. It's an incredible business. I mean, your ROEs are off the chart. This is unlevered returns of like 60, 60, 70% unlevered. And with an ability to create an infinite number of coffee shops. I mean, in Manhattan, they would put four coffee shops on four corners and none of the businesses went, went, went down. They all did well. So the holy grail is to find the great compounders where the dollar becomes much more valuable. You don't necessarily need to even pay much less than a dollar as long as you're, you're right on the growth prospects and you can run that, then that can work out quite well. So value investing is not dead because investing is not dead. And anything that is not intelligent in terms of investing is not value investing. That, that all falls into the category of speculation. Right, thank you. I, this is the last question from the form, and I think everybody wants to know the answer of this. So in your opinion, what do you think is the most important asset class or investment in the, for the current period, short term, long term, and medium term, which will provide the highest returns? Well, I mean, I think, I think the thing is, I, I said that, you know, we look for an anomalies. Yeah. And generally speaking, they, they always show up in, in different ways. So I think it's the wrong way to approach it. So I don't think you should approach investing top down. I have never approached it top down. I haven't said I need to invest in tech and now let me go find the best tech play or I need to invest in blockchain and let me go find the best, best blockchain a bet and so on. I think it's, for me, it's a lot more opportunistic where you're reading a value line and you suddenly see some funeral services at two times and you had no plans until then to ever invest in funeral services ever in your life and there you go on a journey that you never thought you'd be on. And like, I mean, I talked about, talked about this a few times in the past, but in 2018, I was visiting Turkey, visiting a bunch of companies. I have a good friend there who's kind of like a Ben Graham type investor. And so I just told him, listen, I'm coming to Turkey. Can you just go meet all the businesses in your portfolio? And he said, oh, that'd be so much fun, Monish. Let's go do it. And he took me to this one company where they were the largest warehouse operator in Turkey the liquidation value of their warehouses which was really easy to calculate. They had about 12 million square feet. It was close to a billion dollars. And they had about 
200 million dollars of debt on it. So, you know, 800 million, you know, book value, if you will, or, or uh, market value. And the stock was at 20 million. And they had a bunch of other assets besides the book. So I just asked my friend, you know, are these guys frauds? You know, like, are they crooks? What's going on here? And he said, I've never heard anything which is untoward about them. So I said, what's going on here? He said, well, they just never really explain their business. They don't really have an IR department. $20 million, most fund managers don't even take a look at them, you know, and so it's just flying under the radar. And so I, I kicked the tires quite a bit. I went and visited the warehouses and, you know, their clients were like Amazon and Carrefour and Ikea and then 99% lease, 10-year leases, inflation index, really prime properties. I couldn't find anything wrong with it. And then I met the father and son. I find them to be tremendous capital allocators. I found them to be exceptional. And then I thought, you know, how much stock can I get here? It's like so thinly traded or whatever. We ended up, because Turkey is such a hyper traded market, we end up owning one third of the business. I bought one third of that business for $7 million. And then it went up like six, seven times in value in the next couple of years, still undervalued, you know, still big gap from 800 million, but we're not in any hurry. So what I'm saying is that it's bottoms up. I didn't go into Turkey even thinking I'm going to make an investment in Turkey. I just said, let's go check out, you know, the the tea is great. The coffee is great. The baklava is great. And on the side, we'll see if we have some good meetings as well. So I was always focused on the meetings to get some good tea, ask them if they have baklava, and then whatever else happens in that meeting, it's all okay. You know, and then the food was great. uh, You know, dining on the blue fish on the Bosphorus was just great. So there was nothing to complain about. And then also made some money on the side. So it was all fine. But yeah, so I think that, I think the short, medium, long-term, all that doesn't mean much to me. To me, it is all about a treasure hunt. This is a treasure hunt. And we don't know where the treasures come from. I have no idea where the next investment I make will come from. We want to read a lot. We want to have a lot of inputs coming in. So serendipity has a way to happen. And then sometimes we make bets and they don't work. And that's fine too, because Templeton said that if you're wrong, wrong even 30, 40% of the time, you're still okay. It can tolerate a higher rate. That's how I would suggest you, you approach it. Thank you. Now we'll take questions from the floor. Martin, can you unmute yourself and go ahead? Yes, thank you. Well, hello to everyone. It, it's a pleasure and Monish, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's a privilege. Also, thank you to the MBA Finance Club for for doing this event. So here are my questions. I I would like to know how do you differentiate your investment approach relative to, for example, Warren Buffett? Both of you are intelligent investors, but which are the differences that still allows, allows you and him to achieve high returns? If you, also, I would like to know if you have any any insights that you can give us relative to Alibaba and the, the Chinese market. And thirdly, if if were possible to reach out to you, if sometime we have some business opportunity that might be of your interest. Well, Martin, thanks for those questions. You can reach me at mp at pabrifunds.com. I need ideas. So when you find things that are widely mispriced, please call me collect and please send me an email. That'd be very appreciated. Well, you know, Warren Buffett is, is God, you know, he's at a way at a level of performance and, you know, practicing the art in a manner that none of us will get to in our lifetimes. In many ways, he's like a Swiss army knife. So he can invest, you know, 20 different ways, 20 different formats in, in a variety of businesses and industries Sometimes it's compounders, sometimes they are liquidation plays, different ways. So I think Buffett is exceptional on a number of fronts. The good news with him is that he's an open book. He's a teacher. He wants to teach and he's done an exceptional job teaching. He's been very generous with his teaching. And so his, his lessons are available to all of us. It's an open book. In fact, all the Berkshire annual meetings are on CNBC's website for 20 plus years. Those are great. Those are a great resource. The annual reports are a great resource. So I think that even if we figure out 
3% of what Buffett has figured out. And even if we operate in a very narrow circle of competence versus his much broader circle of competence, we can still do really well. So we don't need to be a Swiss army life like Buffett is. If you only understood captive auto finance, for example, or captive finance, and you only invested in that area, you could still do very well just with that understanding. So we don't need a lot of bells and whistles to do that. Regarding Alibaba, well, I mean, I think that I used to have a large position in Alibaba. Most of it we have switched over to Process. I thought that's a somewhat better bet, which owns Tencent. I think both Alibaba and Tencent are amazing businesses. There is a lot of uncertainty and even probably a lot of risk related to the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. If they decide they want to kabash these businesses, they have the power to do that. I don't think they'd want to do that. But clearly, China has gone down a path. And in fact, the, the whole world is going down a path where they're trying to define rules for the big tech companies. The big tech companies have run their affairs like the Wild West. So they are going to face more regulation and they are going to face more restrictions. But the history of this arena is that in the US, when the government went after businesses for antitrust, like when they went after Microsoft or AT&T or IBM or any of these companies, if you invested right after those investigations were launched or announced, you did really well as an investor. And the reason is that when the government finally realizes that a business has an unfair competitive advantage, it means that's a really, really strong advantage. And the second is that the companies usually are able to run circles around the regulators in terms of how they leverage them. I mean, just look at Google in Europe, right? I mean, they have it out for Google in Europe. They want to really slam Google and Apple and all these companies really hard. And they've been trying to do it for so many years. But even if Google pays a 1 billion, 2 billion, 3 billion fine, it is meaningless. That engine is so strong and so powerful that what looks like a big victory to the regulator is just a pimple on a camel's butt. It's irrelevant to Google. So I think that in China, it may be something similar where the regulations are coming in, but what that demonstrates is the power of these models. And these models may have some things, some wings getting clipped, but they may continue to do well in spite of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll have time for only one last short question because we've got some questions in the chat as well. I've mentioned uh, Monish's email address in the chat, so if anybody needs to have get their own questions answered so they can email him directly. So one last question, Mitan, can you please unmute yourself and go ahead? Thank you so much, Monish. You have always been a proponent of cloning like crazy. So would you recommend any managers or professionals who we should sort of follow and clone like crazy? Thank you so much. Yeah, I think, I think one person I think that you should really study is Chuck Akri. There's a Google talk. If you just, you know, go on YouTube and just, you know, do Google Talks, Chuck Akri, it'll pull up. He also did another interview with uh, a podcast called Invest Like the Best. And I think you can pull up a bunch of other interviews about Chuck Akri. And I think Chuck Akri is very interesting to study because he's the opposite of Buffett in terms of a Swiss army knife. He is a one trick pony, but the one trick he has is so powerful. He talks about this three-legged stool. And the three-legged stool, I'll, I'll just go over a little bit just to complete the point. The three-legged stool is basically a stool that's used by farmers for milking a cow. You know, a little stool that they sit on before the, everything got automated to, to milk the cow. And he has a bunch of these three-legged stools in his office. And he says when he invests in a business, he's looking for the three legs of the stool. The first leg, he wants the business to be generating very high returns on equity and assets, high ROE businesses, high ROE businesses without much leverage. That's the first leg. The second leg is he's looking for great people. He says great people who care about enriching outside shareholders who they don't even know. 
and they're great managers, high ethics, and you know, understand capital allocation. So great business, which is high ROE, great people. And the third part of the, of the leg is the ability of the business to reinvest its earnings at similarly high rates. And those are his three legs. And if you find those three legs, the third one is really hard to find. So for example, if you look at a business like MasterCard, which has very high returns on equity, run by Ajay Banga, great guy, they have no ability to reinvest the money because the business needs no capital. It's so efficient. Whereas a business like Starbucks, for example, has all three legs because they could eventually have an infinite number of stores and tells you how dumb I am. Where I've known this for a while. I still don't own Starbucks. So stupid. But the thing is, so all Chuck Akery has done is focus on these three-legged stools. And sometimes he make a, makes an investment and it doesn't work out. They end up compounding at 7% or something. And he eventually takes his chips off the table. But he's had he's had 200 baggers in his portfolio, several 10 baggers. He's beaten the market very soundly over many decades. And that's, I think, a tremendous model. Thank you so much. I think there was a question about the last name of Chuck. It's Akri, A-K-R-E. Thank you. So now I'll be handing it over to Shreyas to end the session. Thank you. Yeah, so... So on behalf of NUS MBA Finance Club and the NUS MBA Club ecosystem, I would like to thank you, Mr. Monish, for sharing your insights with us. It was a privilege having you here. We definitely have something to take back home, although we are at home. <laughs> what, was, what was most intriguing for me, at least, was how you picked on these anomalies and also the industries which, were, which are usually overlooked, something like a captive finance arm or funeral services. It has also motivated me to look for these industries and hopefully make money out of it. <laughs> Mr. Monish, I hope to see you in future events organized by NUS. And to all the participants, thank you for joining in and showing in your enthusiasm. Have a fantastic week ahead, everyone. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be with all of you. And yeah, I would love to be back at NUS. It was a lot of fun. I think all of you will do really well and glad to see COVID is in the waning ending phases hopefully and we can get back to our lives which will be great thank you thank you thank you